and especially extending from the uh, preclinical laboratory out uh, to start to do work with humans. And one area of research they, they were doing there was on tobacco. And whether it was still early enough, there were questions like why do people smoke in a scientific sense of why do people smoke. And so they were among the first to be able to really start zeroing in on the, the role of nicotine in um, cigarette smoking and looking at smoking as a form of drug self-administration. And then um, Dorothy and John Hughes, who was a, uh, I don't know, was he a fellow there or something? Yeah. Then became professor, but the two I was thinking about them this morning, maybe the two more clinically trained and oriented among the many trainees out there. Is there again, there was this hotbed. For those who know behavioral pharmacology, George Bigelow was from there, had recently finished his training there, I think. Rowan Griffiths, uh, Jack Henningfield, there, um, Dick Meisch, uh, there's just so many people out there. And um, so Dorothy and John Hughes were the first to characterize the uh, tobacco or nicotine withdrawal syndrome and um, developed a valid and reliable questionnaire to measure that. It's been a profound uh, contribution that um, is still very, very timely. We use it in our current studies. Um, they have updated it, but it's, it is really, it's a huge contribution. But then Dorothy did not only uh, work on nicotine, she went on to make also many important contributions in other areas of substance abuse. And the one that stands out for me is a contribution in cocaine where she wrote a very influential uh, review paper with co-authored with Marion Fishman on um, comparing the psychopharmacology of uh, crack cocaine to other powdered forms of cocaine. And the question, is it fair? Are they really that different? Is it fair that people, usually minorities, who would have crack cocaine would get these terrible sentences, and then those who are using uh, powdered cocaine, often um, Caucasians, would get relatively light sentences and that sort of thing. This was more, the focus was on the science and not on as I recall it, not on the more political implications or whatnot, but I think it was the start of what eventually um, came to be uh, efforts to get this w more parity between those different forms and, and less disparities in prosecuting people around cocaine. Um, and so more recently, she has been leading and most relevant to, to work we're doing here at the University of Vermont, Dorothy has been doing leading studies in the uh, relatively new and emerging area of tobacco regulatory science. And a big one was a study that appeared in the New England Journal of, um, of Medicine recently, looking at the uh, possibility of um, a policy to reduce the nicotine levels in cigarettes to a sub-addiction threshold so that people would be better able to make choices about whether they wanted to continue smoking or not as opposed to being driven to continue through um, addiction or physical dependence. So Dorothy has you know, just a wonderful career, huge contributions in diverse areas of addiction. She was telling me this morning she's also working in many other areas of, of cancer that I'm not even aware of. So that just further underscores her breadth. Um, uh, approximately five, 400 publications, so, so extremely productive. So um, please join me in welcoming Dorothy. Thank you, Steve, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and it's really nice to, to come to a place where people actually read your articles. <laughs> it was great this morning to talk to pre-docs and post-docs, and, and they would mention an article that um, I had written with other co-authors, and it was really nice to, to have that occur. So um, let me see. I can't remember how to. Is it through the computer, maybe? So I'm going to be talking about. Oops, did I do something wrong? Um, let me see. Oops. 
Yep, I got it. So um, I'm going to be talking about changing the landscape of nicotine addiction and tobacco harm. And this is an area that I've been working on for the past probably mm, 10, 15 years now. So um, the Surgeon Generals came out uh, in a report in 2014 that said that the burden of death and disease in the U.S. is overwhelmingly caused by cigarettes and other combusted tobacco products. And therefore, the rapid elimination of use will dramatically reduce the burden. And so we know that cigarette smoking targets almost every organ in the body. And as a result, um, we have over five uh, over 480,000 deaths per year in the U.S., and that's a phenomenal amount. And Steve and I were talking about how people have become immune to this number. If there was anything, any product out in the market where we said it kills a half a million people a year, I think the government would take it away. <laughs> but yet we condone um, the, um, the manufacturing and, and selling of these um, incredibly toxic products. 16 million people in the U.S. are experiencing some smoking-caused illness, um, and the life expectancy for smokers is at least 10 years shorter um, than people that are non-smokers. And unfortunately, um, the greatest impact is on lower SES smokers, and, and so we are talking about the most vulnerable population that um, are smoking. So how can we achieve a world without cigarettes or other combusted products um, so that future generations don't die of smoking-caused uh, disease? Well, there have been a number of strategies that have been proposed. Um, some people have said, well, what we need to do is redouble our effort um, to prevent uh, tobacco, uh, redouble our efforts on um, proven tobacco control methods, and that includes increasing taxes, smoking bans, anti-smoking media campaigns, which the CDC and FDA, as well as the Truth Initiative, have been working on. And they've been um, actually uh, uh, coming up with some really effective campaigns. Uh, and access to evidence-based treatments. So really making a, a concerted effort to, to um, implement these uh, methods. People have also talked about increasing the purchasing of tobacco to um, 21 years old, um, which they have done in Hawaii, and I heard also in San Francisco, and hopefully other states um, will follow, other states and localities will follow. They've also talked about limiting advertise, advertising as well as retail outlets that sell tobacco products, so only having a certain number of, of outlets that will sell these um, tobacco products, and also banning price discounting. So taxation or price of cigarettes is the most effective, one of the most effective tools we have in terms of decreasing smoking, and yet you get a lot of price discounts um, by coupons that are sent by uh, tobacco companies, so um, prohibiting that. Uh, now we actually have another tool in our uh, toolkit that I think will pro be proven to be proved to be um, really effective, and that's the um, Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, uh, as well as the Articles 9 and 10 in the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. This framework is a treaty that has been signed by different countries in the world uh, to engage in uh, tobacco control efforts. Um, and it has been signed by most countries, uh, except for the U.S. and maybe Afghanistan and a few other countries, um, primarily because uh, the U.S. did not sign it because of the first uh, First Amendment, and um, there are articles in that um, treaty that say that we should ban advertising for cigarette smoking. So that's one of the reasons why the U.S. has not signed on to this treaty. But anyway, um, these will allow uh, the different countries, including the U.S., as a result of our Tobacco Control Act, to establish product standards on our um, tobacco products, so uh, standards that could um, lead to a reduction in its uh, attractiveness, uh, a reduction in its addictiveness, as well as reduction in the toxicity of um, the product. So I think this is a really powerful tool. So first I want to talk about a reduction of, addic uh, of attractiveness. So when we're talking about uh, a product being attractive, we're talking about some of the flavors that um, 
tobacco manufacturers put in their tobacco products, as well as the different formulations. Um, and you can see some of the, the different formula, uh, the different flavors we have, as well as formulations like this um, Camel Crush, where they had a menthol bead in the filter, and if you squeeze it a certain amount, you can get certain intensities of menthol, and so that becomes very appealing, and um, it, what happened is that more recently the, um, the people at the FDA decide to take it off the market because of something that's called substantially equivalent. So any product that is um, not substantially equivalent to products that were sold before 2007 have to demonstrate that they are equivalent in terms of harm, uh, potential public health harm, um, to the prior products. And with this particular product, they felt that it was not uh, didn't show any kind of, of uh, reduced harm. In fact, it might have increased um, public health harm. So they took it off the market. Um, but there are many ways that uh, products are made very appealing. You know, the slimness of the product, the fact that there's filter ventilation, and so there's a lot more elasticity to the cigarette product, which means that people can control the levels of nicotine. So many, many things that could uh, go in the design um, of the cigarette. Um, the great thing is that the uh, Tobacco Control Act did ban flavored cigarettes, um, and so that's good. So we don't have um, Kahlua-flavored or uh, lime-flavored, um, many berry-flavored cigarettes out on the market anymore. Um, but um, what the Act said was that with menthol cigarettes, they didn't want to ban them. What they wanted to do is to have the Tobacco uh, Product Scientific Advisory Committee review the literature on menthol to determine whether it has uh, a negative impact on public health. And so the TIPSAC committee, um, and I was fortunate enough to be a member, uh, or maybe it was unfortunate to be a member of the committee when we were uh, doing this review on menthol cigarettes, um, actually came out with a recommendation uh, that the removal of menthol cigarettes from the marketplace would benefit public health in the U.S. So um, they thought that actually banning menthol uh, would be advantageous. And, and the reason they um, came up with this is because they thought that there was sufficient evidence that indicated that menthol cigarette increases experimentation and regular smoking, um, that it increases the likelihood of addiction uh, and degree of addiction, in, uh, particularly among youth smokers, although later when the FDA did its own research uh, into the area, they felt that it also um, increased uh, addiction among adult smokers. And it also results in a lower likelihood of smoking cessation uh, success, particularly among the African American population. So that's why they came up with that recommendation. Um, but unfortunately, just banning um, characterizing flavors such as menthol uh, still leaves us with palatable cigarettes. And in fact, shortly after that report came out, you can see what uh, kind of advertising uh, had occurred from the tobacco industry. Um, and you can see it says, uh, for the ultimate pleasure, always uh, bet on red. Uh, it's rich, it's red. It's non-menthol. So, you know, there are always ways that the tobacco companies um, come up, uh, ideas that they come up with that might undermine uh, what kind of regulations that might be imposed. Um, we still have menthol in cigarettes. I don't know what the FDA is going to do regarding um, banning menthol. But um, the truth of the matter is that we still are going to have addictive cigarettes on the market, and, and that's not a good thing. There are other ways that people have proposed uh, reducing the appeal of the cigarettes. It would uh, eliminate all non-characterizing flavorants. So when we talk about menthol and when the, um, uh, when the TIPSAC report uh, came out, we were only talking about characterizing flavors. So there are all kinds of flavors and sugars and things like that that are put in cigarettes um, that might make the cigarette appealing, but they're not considered to be characterizing. There's not enough um, flavors in it to, to characterize it as a, a particular flavor. But maybe eliminating these non-characterizing flavors would be uh, make the cigarette uh, very unappealing. People have also talked about increasing the pH to 8 to make it very harsh. Um, and so um, that would certainly make the cigarette 
unappealing, as well as eliminating ventilated uh, filters. And um, some of the, the research on ventilated filters is that uh, the, increasing, um, the increase in adenocarcinoma is a result of the ventilated filters because people feel that it's a smooth smoke. They inhale it a lot more. They're also lower in tar and, and, and nicotine as a result of the ventilation holes. So they breathe it in much more deeply into their lungs, and, and there's some speculation that that's why we see so much adenocarcinoma. So those are some of the, the proposed methods. But really, um, oh, the, the other method that's um, considered is reducing the, the toxicity of a product. And this is a, a study uh, that we did um, looking at the, the various levels of NNK. NNK is a really potent lung carcinogen in different um, cigarette products. And, and what we observed is that there's a cigarette um, called Marlboro Virginia Blend. Um, disregard the, the little uh, pyridine uh, DNNK. That was something, it was for another uh, presentation, so disregard that. But if you take a look at the dark bars, what you see is that there's a lot of variation in terms of the NNK levels. And the Marlboro Virginia blend is the lowest. It has very low NNK levels, um, whereas the popular blends, uh, cigarette brands such as Camel regulars or Marlboro regulars or Newport regulars, you can see that the levels are significantly higher. So uh, in this particular study, what we did is we switched people um, who were smoking those popular brands to the Virginia Blend uh, Marlboro cigarettes. And what we found is that um, in the green uh, columns, you see uh, total nicotine equivalence, which is a biomarker for nicotine exposures. You can see that there's really no significant difference. Um, but in terms of total NNL as well as total NNN, total NNN is also a carcinogen that is a risk factor for esophageal cancer. You'll see that there was a significant difference um, between their usual brand and when we switched them to the uh, Mar Marlboro Virginia blend. Um, the problem is that um, cigarettes have more than, they have uh, 70 carcinogens. Uh, some of them are combusted, or most of them are combusted, and so you're still getting uh, a lot of other carcinogens. So even though you lower some of these uh, tobacco-specific nitrosamines, uh, it doesn't necessarily translate into reduced risk. So, you know, this probably isn't an effective approach uh, to reduce the mortality and morbidity from cigarette smoking. So um, really, probably the most effective method would be to reduce the addictiveness of the, the uh, cigarette product. And in fact, um, again, in the 2014 Surgeon General's report, uh, what was said is that there's new end game strategies have been proposed with the goal of eliminating tobacco smoking. Some of these strategies may prove useful for the United States, particularly reduction of nicotine yield of tobacco products to non-addictive levels. So even the Surgeon General <laughs> had mentioned that. Um, and in fact, in a document in 1959, um, you find that um, the, they, the tobacco industry reinforces the importance of nicotine to sustain addiction. Here they're saying reducing nicotine in cigarettes might end in destroying the nicotine habit in a large number of consumers and prevent it ever being acquired by new smokers, which is exactly what we want. And so, um, so and, and actually it was over 20 years ago that um, Neil Benowitz and Jack Henningfield had proposed this as a way to prevent adolescents from acquiring nicotine dependence. And what they did is they thought it was, um, I think over a 15, 10 to 15 year period that we can reduce the levels of nicotine uh, in cigarettes as a national policy measure so that we can reduce the, the rate of smoking, again, particularly among our ad, uh, adolescents. But this idea remained dormant for 20 years because there was no governmental agency that had um, jurisdiction over um, the tobacco um, products. And so, you know, it was only when we had the Smoking Prevention Tobacco Control Act that now we had a federal agency, the FDA, having jurisdiction over um, uh, tobacco products. And so prior to knowing that, 
down the line that there will be um, uh, the FDA oversight uh, on tobacco products. Uh, Mitch Seller, who is now the um, Center for uh, Tobacco Products uh, Director uh, at the FDA, he and I had organized a group of people to take a look at this concept that Jack and, and Jack Hennifield and, and Neil Benowitz had proposed over 20 years ago. So we reviewed the data at that time, and we felt that there was considerable um, relevant research that has been conducted, and many of the results support the potential viability of the approach of reducing nicotine to non-addictive levels. And what was really great about having convened this meeting was that we had um, a number of people that were from um, governmental agencies. So we had people from NIDA, we had people from NCI, as well as um, F, uh, the Federal Trade Commission and FDA, and they, you know, they heard these presentations. They heard that this was a viable method, uh, and many of these people, especially people that were at NCI and NIDA, had since joined the FDA. So what's great is the FDA thought that this was really an important topic to uh, consider. And the person that I co-organized this meeting is, like I said, is now the, the center director. So, so that was good. I mean, people really thought that, yeah, this is really a good idea. But um, what we also concluded is that more research is necessary to rec recommend reducing nicotine in cigarettes as a, a public policy measure. So um, we did a fine, uh, define some of the limitations and gaps that need to be um, considered uh, before we propose it as a policy measure. Um, one of the things, the, the main limitations were um, they were clinical trials that were done, but with, will, with uh, very small sample size. So most of the trials were done by Neil Benowitz, and we had conducted some trials too. Um, but um, in our particular uh, projects, they were people that were interested in smoking. So these are people that were motivated to quit. And of course, if you're going to have a public policy measure, not everybody's going to be motivated to quit. And so we needed to, to broaden, we needed studies that broadened their samples. So um, there are also, we also identified areas that really needed to be addressed. Uh, and they included um, the dose that would minimize acquisition of nicotine self-administration, especially in adolescents. We also needed to know the dose of nicotine that would reduce dependence uh, and facilitate cessation of smokers. Um, any of the potential unintended consequences that would occur if um, there was a reduction in nicotine content. Um, also, the best approach for reducing nicotine in cigarettes. Should we do a gradual reduction approach um, that uh, Dr. Um, Benowitz and Henningfield had proposed, or should it be an immediate reduction? That is, telling the cigarette manufacturers that, you know, two years from now, on June 17th, you need to have all cigarettes that are manufactured to be below a certain level. So we really didn't know what the best approach would be. And also, um, the effects on the vulnerable population of smokers, which is great that um, you folks here, your t cores is, is addressing that particular population. Uh, those populations, so um, it's great that, that you're doing that. We're um, in our CNEX study um, where we're funded as a cooperative agreement. We're also taking a look at the best approach for uh, reducing nicotine in cigarettes, and we're, um, we've recruited over 800 people in a 1,250 um, uh, subject trial at this point in time, and hopefully by next year we'll know what might be you know, the, the best approach to, to reducing nicotine cigarettes. I'm going to be covering the top three um, uh, parts of the, uh, the, that particular slide. So um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to first look at the dose response effects on the acquisition of nicotine self-administration. And of course, you can't do it in humans. You have to do it in rats, because you can't take naive uh, you know, humans, naive users of tobacco products, and, and then give them these cigarettes. So you have to do it in rats. And um, when Eric Donny was here, he may have presented this data. But you do see a dose uh, response effect. Um, so the lower the dose, the fewer number of rats that acquire nicotine self-administration. So that's really good news. Um, and of those that require, uh, that acquire uh, nicotine self-administration, it takes a longer time for them to acquire, which is on the right um, side figure. So that's good news, and I, I think they're replicating this with the adolescent um, rat population. This was done in, in adult rats. So the other qu question is dose 
uh, effects on smoking behavior, dependence on quit attempts. And this was the, the New England Journal of Medicine article um, where we uh, randomized uh, smokers to various doses of, of nicotine. And um, there were seven of them. Uh, two of them were normal nicotine levels, um, their usual brand or uh, a steady cigarette that contained 15.8 milligrams of uh, per gram of nicotine. Oops, what happened there? It must be timed <laughs> for some reason. Um, and then the other uh, cigarettes were, uh, steady cigarettes were lower in nicotine content um, from 5.2 milligrams per gram uh, to 0.4 milligrams per gram. In the 0.4 milligrams per gram, we had um, very low tar versus, uh, or I'm sorry, normal tar versus high tar, because we wanted to see what the impact of tar would be. So um, I know that uh, probably Dr. Uh, Donnie had presented some of these results, uh, and so I'm just going to um, summarize them quickly. Um, what we found in this particular study, um, and these are, people were on these cigarettes for a period of six weeks, and after the six-week period, we had them abstain uh, for a period of 16 hours. Um, and so um, what we found is that, that there was a dose-related uh, uh, effects on total nicotine equivalents. So that was good. So you just saw a dose response on that. And relative to the 15.8 milligrams per gram nicotine cigarette, we saw a significantly reduced smoking rate when the cigarettes were less than 2.4 milligrams per gram. And uh, on top of that, what we saw, what, what we didn't see, interestingly, is we didn't see a reduction in number of cigarettes that were smoked. Um, they were very similar to baseline. And what we suspected is the reason why is because these cigarettes were provided free. And so when you provide free cigarettes, they'll just smoke as much as they want. Um, so the people that were in the 15.8 actually smoked a lot more uh, of the cigarettes. But um, when we asked them, well, what if the cigarettes cost $6 um, per a pack? Then they said that they would, in fact, uh, reduce um, their cigarette consumption um, among the people that uh, had smoked less than or equal to 2.4 milligrams per gram. We also saw a significant reduction um, in scores on dependence measures for cigarettes that were less than or equal to 2.4 milligrams per gram. And we also saw significantly reduced scores on satisfaction and psychological reward, but at the doses that were less than or equal to 5.2 milligrams per gram. And for um, the, um, uh, the self-report measure that assesses enjoyment of respiratory tract sensation and craving reduction, we saw a significant reduction relative to the 15.8 for cigarettes that were less than 2.4 milligrams per gram. So what this tells me is that um, actually the satisfaction on, uh, for cigarettes actually has a higher dose of nicotine in which you see some differences. So, you know, people that are, are switched to a little bit slightly lower um, dose than, um, than the, um, the 15.8 might actually uh, detect uh, or report less satisfaction in, in the cigarette than what you would find with um, some of the dependence measures. So this gives you an idea of what the reduction in satisfaction looked like. So, you know, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, I just can't believe how beautiful it is. It's uh, a clearly a dose response um, uh, report uh, or dose response effect. And um, I think, uh, What's interesting is that you also see the effect being immediate, and it sustains itself over the, the six-week period of time. You don't really see that much change regarding the reduction in satisfaction. So um, we also found that the dose of nicotine significantly influences ease of cessation and quit attempts. So um, during the period that they were abstinence, they're, uh, abstinent, they were significantly reduced in attention and desire to smoke at uh, doses that were less than or equal to 2.4 milligrams per gram, and relief of negative affect and, um, and uh, I should say negative affect for doses at uh, less than or equal to 1.3 milligrams per gram. And finally, we saw significantly higher quit attempts at 0.4 milligrams per gram nicotine. So it was really at the very lowest dose that we saw increased in terms of, uh, increase in terms of quit attempts. 
Now, at the end of the study, this is new data, um, which hasn't been, which wasn't in the New England Journal article. We asked about um, what would happen if starting today, if the study cigarette was the only type of cigarette available to purchase um, by a year from uh, now, I would. Uh, and, and the green says, stop smoking. The lighter green says, smoke less. Uh, the yellow says, smoke the same. And, um, and the red shows smokes more. And what you can see is that um, people had reported that, uh, uh, that they would actually uh, stop smoking uh, for cigarettes that were 5.2 milligrams per gram or less. So, you know, th this is good. Whereas the 15.8 milligram, you can see that there are um, people that were saying that they would smoke um, the same, essentially. So, um, I think that this is really uh, supports, you know, um, the reduction in, in nicotine in cigarettes. So um, some of the unintended consequences uh, that we looked at, um, one thing that was really great was that there's no increase in carbon monoxide or carcinogen exposure or increase in smoking intensity. And we uh, took a look at um, smoking topography and we didn't see any increase in smoking behavior. So I think that that's good. There's minimal compensatory smoking behavior. There are no steady uh, cigarette serious adverse events. We also found no increase in use of alcohol or marijuana. So that's good. They're not uh, compensating by drinking more or smoking more marijuana. No increase in levels of depression. That was one of the things that we were concerned about. Um, but what we did find is an increase in weight gain, which was kind of expected because people who quit smoking do increase weight and um, they are likely to seek alternative nicotine sources. And we say that because about 70 to 80 percent of our population um, smoked um, their usual brand cigarettes. Okay, so what that means is um, if you get the cigarette nicotine content low enough, you know, they, they need, they're, they're going to seek other ways to, to get nicotine into their system. So this is a study that we had conducted under another cooperative agreement. And um, what we wanted to take a look at is the effects of very low nicotine um, content cigarettes on the use of alternative products and nicotine products that we provide to people. They have access to these products. And so what we did is we randomized these individuals for an eight-week period of time to very low nicotine content cigarettes. And in this particular study, we used 1.3 milligrams per gram. And the reason why is because we hadn't had the scenic um, project uh, up and running. Uh, or finished, completed, so we didn't know what dose would be best. So we just chose a dose um, that we thought was pretty, pretty low. Um, so it was a 1.3 milligram per gram nicotine cigarette with access to non-combusted and combusted tobacco products. And these are non-cigarette combusted products. Um, we also um, had another group that where they were randomized with access to, to just non-combusted products. Um, and then a normal nicotine content um, condition where they were randomized to access to both non-combusted and combusted products. And so here, oh, and they were blinded to the dose of nicotine in their cigarettes. So here are the products that we made ava available. So for the combusted products, they included popular brands of large cigars, cigarellos, and little cigars. And for the non-combusted tobacco and nicotine products, it were, they were electronic cigarettes like Enjoy and Blue e-cigarettes, Camel Snooze and various brands of smokeless tobacco, as well as uh, nicotine replacement therapies. And they came in different flavors and different um, unit uh, packaging. So um, they were made available. And, and what we did is we gave these people points. So we gave the cigarettes free. But we gave them points which they can exchange for these products or they can um, exchange for cash at the end of treatment. So what did we see? We saw that those individuals that were assigned to the very low nicotine content cigarette um, condition actually used more alternative products on more days and greater proportion of days um, than people that were assigned to the normal nicotine content cigarette condition. As you can see, even in the normal nicotine content um, cigarette condition, people did use alternative products, but um, it was more so in the very low nicotine content cigarette condition. 
What we also looked at um, is how um, each of the conditions, how many combusted products each of the conditions uh, used. And, um, and so what you see here is that there was a significant reduction compared to the normal nicotine content cigarettes in terms of the total units and combustible products used. And that's in your left hand um, uh, figure. And the dotted and the dashed lines are the ones that are the very low nicotine content conditions. What we also said, uh, saw is um, despite the fact that these people had access to alternative products, um, the people that were assigned to the very low nicotine content conditions, both of them had um, significantly lower total nicotine equivalents <coughs> compared to the uh, normal nicotine content cigarette condition. So what we also saw was that there was a decrease in dependence uh, in the very low nicotine content condition regardless of whether we gave them alternative products, and also an increase in quit attempts among those people that were in the um, very uh, low nicotine content condition. So even though they had access to these alternative treatments, they were doing fine. You know, they reduced the number of uh, cigarettes that they smoked, and they reduced their dependence on cigarettes uh, and, and other combusted products, as well as increased in credit attempts. So this is what I think might happen if we do reduce the levels of nicotine in combusted products to the level that is um, very low um, or minimally addictive. What we might see is an increase in terms of the, the non-combusted um, nicotine delivery products. And so how would this landscape of tobacco addiction affect tobacco-caused harm? Well, what we also saw um, in that study that I was talking about is that among the very low nicotine content group, we saw a significant reduction in total NNL, which is, again, a biomarker for N and K, um, and that is uh, a potent carcinogen for lung cancer, uh, whereas we did not see, this is mislabeled, we did not see uh, um, any kind of significant reduction in the normal nicotine content group, a slight one, but it was not significant. Um, the, uh, the significant um, condition was actually only, I've forgotten to mention, was actually only among those people that had access to very low nicotine content and access to non-combusted products. Um, not in the other condition, I forgot to mention that. So um, it, it looks like we might be able to reduce exposure to harmful uh, agents, um, despite the fact that they're uh, picking up alternative products. So um, if we take a look at these alternative products, um, this is the relative risk of cancer in cigarette smokers versus snus users. So snus is a, a product that's um, sold in Sweden that are um, lower in tobacco-specific nitrosamines um, than some of the products sold in the U.S. And what you, can do, what you can see is that cigarette smokers that are in blue have much higher risk for lung cancer, oral, and pancreatic cancer compared to people that are snus users. So if people switch from cigarettes to these snus products, um, there's a likelihood that they'll have lower risk of these various types of cancers, um, and probably cardiovascular disease as well. What we also did is we conducted a study looking at exposure biomarker levels in e-cigarette users versus cigarette smokers. And so we looked at uh, a number of carcinogens, um, one hydroxypyrene, um, total NNL, total NNN, again, biomarkers for N and K, NNN. Uh, we also looked at biomarkers for, um, for uh, uh, acrolene, um, uh, crotonaldehyde, uh, poly, oh, let's see, it's, um, polypropylene oxide, I think, uh, and benzene. And so what we found is that in all the exposures of biomarkers, um, we, uh, for car carcinogens, we found a, a significant reduction or less than uh, cigarette smokers, um, with the exception of cotony, which is not a carcinogen. It's just a biomarker for uh, nicotine. We found equivalent levels between those, um, the e-cigarette smokers and cigarette smokers. I think what was really interesting is when we compared these um, e-cigarette users to typical non-smoker values, uh, what we observed is that in most 
if not all these um, carcinogens, there was um, there were equivalent levels. So e-cigarette users were equivalent in levels of these carcinogens to non-tobacco users. So you know, that's that's that says something in terms of the potential for harm reduction with electronic cigarettes. Um, but what we did find is that there wasn't really a significant reduction um, in um, oxidants or inflammation biomarkers between e-cigarettes um, users and smokers. So that's something that we're trying to follow up. Now, um, so, you know, these products, if we have them switch from cigarettes to these alternative products, we'll probably see a significant reduction in tobacco-related mortality or morbidity. But there's still some steps that we need to take. Um, and um, they include establishing product standards for these products. So on the top um, figure, what you see are the levels of NNN plus NNK uh, on smokeless tobacco products that are sold here in the United States. And you can see a great deal of uh, variability. Um, the, uh, the bars to the uh, right actually are snooze products that are sold in the United States. Uh, they're not very popular products in the United States. Um, the Kodiak and Grizzly are the more popular products that are sold in the United States, and yet you see a significant, you know, higher levels of these toxicants. So um, there was a proposal that uh, Irina Stepanov and I had um, submitted to the FDA as well as published that said what we need to do is to establish product standards for all smokeless tobacco products that are sold in the United States. They have product standards in Sweden. Why is it that we continue to sell extraordinarily toxic smokeless tobacco um, products um, when we know that there are ways that they can reduce it? And um, actually reducing them might actually have beneficial effects in terms of particularly oral cancer among smokeless tobacco users. So establishing um, product standards on some of the smokeless tobacco products or all the smokeless tobacco products is important. And equally important is establishing product standards on electronic cigarettes um, because there are some that contain um, carcinogenic Genic carbonyls, traces of tobacco-specific nitrosamines, that is the NNN and NK, uh, and there's a lot of performance variations across these uh, various products. So um, and once FDA does not have deeming over electronic cigarettes, but once they have deeming over um, these products, then it would be important for them to establish product standards for these products. Now, um, so how can we maximize benefits and minimize harm in this harm reduction approach? Um, so switching, uh, switch to um, non-combusted products would lead to significant reduction in death and disease if the um, non-combusted products were, of course, far less uh, dangerous to the individual user. And so it would be really important to have the evidence to show that it does do this. Um, also, uh, the smokers who switched to non-combusted would have otherwise continued to smoke. That is, we're not keeping people from quitting, you know, essentially. Um, that They're not switching uh, just because they wanted to use a nicotine product, um, uh, which otherwise they would have just said, no, I don't want it to use any product. Um, they have to have complete substitution for smoking, uh, and we don't want to increase recidivism to cigarette use again. Uh, we also don't want to perpetuate continued addiction to cigarettes, and uh, we do not want to increase uptake among youth or former smokers, uh, and nor do we want these products to serve as gateway to cigarettes. So what are ways to maximize harm minimization? Um, now, it's more likely to occur harm minimization and switching to these um, non-combusted products and more likely to occur if combusted products were less addictive and, of course, less appealing, too. We also have, um, might consider differential taxation of products based on upon toxicity with a minimum price of non-combusted products. So, you know, you, what you want to do is make sure that the combusted products are really high in terms of price, but the non-combusted products shouldn't be cheap. They should also be high, but relatively less than the combusted products. We also want uh, consumer education of the relative risk of products. It is just appalling to me that a lot of consumers just do not know that nicotine replacement products are not as dangerous as cigarette smoking. 
they think it is as dangerous as cigarette smoking, and that's that's absurd. You know, <laughs> that's what prevents some people from continuing to use nicotine replacement products because they think it's as dangerous as cigarette smoking. So we need to do a lot better education in terms of relative risks of products. We need to to also. Um, I think people are really misinformed too um, about electronic cigarettes. Um, you know, they they consider it as being as dangerous as cigarette electronic cigarettes as dangerous as cigarette smoking, and, and that's um, that's a, um, that's not right to misinform consumers. And then we also need to educate health professionals, parents, and youth of the negative effects of nicotine. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of literature that's coming out nowadays that says nicotine is actually not very good for the adolescent brain. It changes the circuitry. It might um, uh, increase susceptibility to using other drugs of abuse. And so it's um, very important to, to educate people about uh, the effects of nicotine itself. I think the other important notion is that even though we do see an increase in, in terms of the non-combusted products, um, we still can have regulations on the non-combusted uh, products if, if we find that there's um, you know, increasing harm. We can, uh, you know, with the, the conversion from combusted to non-combusted, um, what we can do is to gradually increase the, the price of the non-combusted products. We might set a cap in terms of the levels of nicotine in these non-combusted products. So there are things that we can do to, um, to make sure um, that in the future, um, this landscape does not become a disaster, <laughs> you know, essentially. So what we hope to do what we hope to do by um, reducing the levels of, of nicotine in the combusted products where the prevalence becomes very low, um, with, you know, even with the enhancement of, of um, uptake of non-combusted products, I think we're going to see a significant decline in terms of certain cancers. And I, I point to the lung cancer. I think that what's going to happen is that, sure, we'll see a, a decrease in prevalence of smoking, over time, and we'll see a decrease in, in lung cancer in particular over time, as shown in the red. But um, I think that we're going to see a more rapid uh, reduction in, in cancers if we reduce the levels of, of nicotine in, in, in cigarettes and allow people to use combusted products. So um, I'm going to talk about some of the concerns people have about reducing levels of nicotine in cigarettes. Um, people have talked about uh, smacks of prohibition. You know, isn't it just uh, pretty much banning cigarettes because you're not uh, allowing any kind of psychoactive effects occurring with, um, you know, these cigarettes? You're taking away the, the main uh, ingredient of the cigarette, so isn't it a prohibition? But I think it's different than prohibition. You know, if you think of alcohol prohibition, we didn't have alternative alcohol products that people can switch to, uh, whereas in, um, you know, if we do reduce the levels of nicotine in combusted or products, what we do have are these uh, alternative non-combusted products. Um, people are saying that the nation is going to undergo massive withdrawal, but here's a study that we conducted. These are people that are interested in quitting smoking. We gave some people nicotine um, patches um, with a very low nicotine content cigarette. Other group, it was just um, nicotine replacement. Uh, and then the other, um, the last one uh, was just very low nicotine content cigarettes. And the, um, the group that we gave the patch plus the very low nicotine content cigarettes, you can see that there was a significant lower level of, of withdrawal compared to the other um, two, two groups. So, you know, if we do add a, a nicotine replacement um, therapy or alternative nicotine product, we're likely not to have people undergo massive withdrawal. The other um, points that are brought up is that there's going to be a, a big illegal market. Uh, but, you know, I think that if we do have alternative nicotine delivery systems and uh, a good track and trade system, we can minimize the illegal market. And then um, consumer revolt. You know, people are just going to be upset about uh, uh, cigarette smokers are going to be upset that we're reducing levels of nicotine in cigarettes. But this is an interesting um, finding. This is uh, something that came from the uh, New England Journal of Medicine study um, that wasn't published um, in that article. But we asked the people, would you support or oppose a law 
that reduced the amount of nicotine to make cigarettes less addictive. And this is after they tried the cigarettes. And it's just astounding to me that a significant number said that they would support it. And the support is in green, um, the oppose is in red. So even after they tried these cigarettes, they said that they would support uh, a law that would um, make cigarettes less addictive. So I'm going to end by um, actually um, describing some of the, the conclusions and recommendations that was made by um, a report, advisory note, uh, from the uh, TABRA group, um, the study on tobacco uh, product regulation group um, from the World Health Organization. Um, they said that the evidence indicates that setting maximum allowable nicotine content for all cigarettes could um, reduce smoking acquisition. It could uh, reduce, uh, increase the rate of quitting and uh, reduce the number of smokers who might relapse. Uh, it could reduce the prevalence of smoking. Uh, it also can increase the development, um, availability, and use of alternative forms of nicotine, which has a potential adverse effects, but less so than combustive products. And in terms of the regulatory um, recommendations, um, the report said that mandated reductions in nicotine to minimally addictive levels should be supported by comprehensive regulation on all nicotine and tobacco-containing products. So you need to have regulation over all these products. Um, because, you know, certainly in, in places like India, where they have extraordinarily toxic smokeless tobacco products, you don't want them to be switching to these toxic products. So you need regulations over all nicotine products. It has to be part of a comprehensive tobacco control. Um, it doesn't mean that you stop thinking about raising taxes on cigarettes um, or having comprehensive smoking bans. It has to, uh, you have to consider maybe reducing levels of nicotine in all combusted tobacco products. And um, they had recommended doing more of an immediate reduction in levels of nicotine versus gradual. They also mentioned the, it's important to have available, effective, and affordable cigarette cessation treatments, uh, as well as alternative forms of nicotine and optimal forms of, of medicinal nicotine so that you can prevent tobacco um, withdrawal uh, among dependent smokers. And then finally, uh, capacity for market surveillance and uh, tobacco product testing that you need to, to monitor what might happen. So last slide here. The, um, this is what uh, Tang had, uh, he did some modeling in terms of what the impact of reducing levels of cigarettes to minimally addictive levels might do, and he said policymakers would be hard pressed to identify another domestic public health intervention short of historical sanitation efforts that has offered this magnitude of benefit to the population. So I want to thank all the, the scenic people that helped, um, uh, that are in the past studies as well as ongoing studies, um, their contributions in, in those studies, as well as the U of M uh, research team. So thank you so much for your attention. Great. Um, we're going to have to And rather than 10 bucks a pack, it's two bucks a pack. And now there's a casino, a casino near every city, and I suspect it's a national phenomenon. Is there any ability to regulate that? Um, I think I'm not really the best person to, to talk uh, about that, but I think they are exempt from regulation. So, you know, if this should be a um, we, you'd have to work with the, you know, the, the and, and one of the things that you have to recognize is in some uh, tribes um, or uh, Native American um, uh, populations, uh, smoking is really a high rate and, and it's killing, you know, these uh, Native Americans. So, you know, working with them and, and making them realize that this is something that is important not only for the population of the U.S., but for, you know, Native mm -hmm. Americans, I think is going to be very critical. How, how often I hear that. And often I'm looking at someone who is disabled and 
<clears throat> drive and say, how do you get them? They, they always have someone who goes. And I think yeah. you know, yeah. little businesses in the home, carloads of cigarettes from Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I actually saw it last night. Okay. I'll be back. Thank you. You're welcome. Hurry up. Is it telling us to get out? This is one. This is one way, right? So, um, I think that uh, that is no the habit of back in the uh, casinos to prevent um, from smoking. Uh, uh, you know, from selling these cigarettes. But, you know, the number of outlets are going to be significantly reduced. Uh, you know, there aren't going to be that many, hopefully, that many outlets that are going to be selling these, um, uh, you know, the usual brand cigarette products. Uh, and hopefully, like I said, you know, in terms of the black market, if we do have alternative products, and I know that tobacco, the big tobacco industry, you know, look at what they're doing. They're getting into the electronic cigarette market now. They're also coming up with other um, products that are, you know, tobacco that's heated and not burned. And so, you know, hopefully what might happen is that um, because we're letting the tobacco industries to come up with these innovative products, that substitution for cigarettes might be a lot easier. Yeah. So, I'm curious about the, uh, <clears throat> the slide that you showed on the Casimir Dream, the level of Casimir Dream and the information, and the level of information, uh, was kind of like curious. Yes. Now, cigarette smoking, as you know, it's not really, even though it depends on the way it's more cancer and all that stuff and so use. But think about, you know, hypertension, heart disease, yes, strokes. Right. And these are all possibly related, I mean, driven by inflammation. Right. In the cancer world, there is now a really beginning, a big understanding now that inflammatory, chronic inflammation itself, it's a causative, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a etiologic factor. Yes, potential. yes. And so when you look at it from that perspective, I'm, I'm afraid that as we talk about this combustible, uh, this um, electronic um, cigarette, and the electronic cigarettes, all those, we'll be driving people to think that this is a safer alternative just to get another crisis tomorrow, which will be caused by driven by COVID, inflammatory stuff and all that. Yeah. I wonder what your thoughts would be. We have a group coming yeah. back, so maybe we can answer that question now out in the uh, hall. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Great job. Great. Yeah. 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 Ye